I'm Nicole Burley. It is Wednesday, September 8th. This is Rush Hour. Those top stories in just a moment. Our News Nation team is spread out across the country. And tonight, we are also following opening statements underway in the trial of Elizabeth Holmes. She's the Silicon Valley star once hailed as the next Steve Jobs, now possibly facing two decades behind bars. Meantime, a quiet residential street looks more like a war zone. 150 bullets fired into this North Carolina home, killing a three-year-old boy. Police say the gunmen are only teenagers themselves. And can we expect more grounded planes and delayed flights as we move into the fall? How a planned pilot protest at one of the country's biggest airlines could impact your travel plans. But we begin tonight in Florida, where a federal judge dealt another major blow to Governor Ron DeSantis and his push to ban those mask mandates in schools. The judge siding with Florida parents who called the governor's order an overreach. But tonight, DeSantis vowing to continue his fight. News Nation's Evan Donovan from our Tampa station WFLA breaks down today's decision and what's next. Today's ruling answered a very narrow question. Who gets to decide whether students should wear masks in schools while this case moves through appeals? For the second time in two weeks, the judge found in favor of the families and against Governor Ron DeSantis. In the initial trial, Judge John Cooper found the governor and the Department of Education had acted unlawfully, overstepping their authority by banning mask mandates in schools. The state immediately appealed, which by law triggered an automatic pause on his ruling. The families then filed a motion to reinstate his order. That hearing was today, and both sides made similar arguments to ones they made during the trial. The family's attorneys said the state will suffer no irreparable harm if school districts are able to require masks, whereas students could get COVID if everyone is not wearing them. The defense argued that case precedent and the law favored their side. In the end, Judge Cooper found in favor of the families, giving every Florida school district the right to make its own mask policy without fear of penalties from the state. Governor Ron DeSantis' team says they will appeal this immediately to the appellate court, which means we could have a different ruling as early as the end of next week. Back to you, Nicole. All right, Evan, thank you for that. Well, as the Delta variant continues spreading around the globe, mixed messages tonight on booster shots. The CDC wants the shots to start this fall, but the World Health Organization is taking a different position. News Nation's Tom Negevin live for us tonight in New York. Now, Tom, the head of the WHO, calling for a moratorium on those booster shots. That's exactly what he's doing, Nicole, and not for the first time, saying this is a, a medical issue, no question, but it's also primarily an issue of vaccine equity globally. Now, while the CDC is talking about giving booster shots to more people in this country over the next couple of months, the WHO's director general wants to see a moratorium on booster shots until the end of the year, at the very least, and probably a lot longer than that, because he says it's time for the wealthier nation simply Put to share with those who have less. There's been a promise to do that, a promise that's been kept to a degree, but a promise that hasn't been fully kept. And until that happens, the West needs to do more. Wealthier countries need to do more. The argument here is that the have not countries have just as much right to survival from COVID 19 as the rest of the world, as the countries that develop the vaccine, that distribute it, that have it, and that by many estimates are hoarding it. That's the expression. That's being used around the world tonight, and they're pointing fingers at the EU and the US of A, saying both are hoarding the vaccine, uh, allowing some, allowing it in some cases to go to waste uh, as opposed to go to countries that need it. And the problem is, this is a global issue that requires global participation and solutions. For example, when the virus is allowed to develop in undeveloped countries, we've seen the result. Variants, mutations that spread like Delta to this country and in New York and America right now, Nicole, we're seeing the results of that at the moment. But yeah, no, Tom, speaking of that, so obviously we know the Delta uh, variant is spreading, but there are some signs that life really is returning to normal. A couple of signs, a couple of uh, very important signs, one of them coming to us today from the United States Supreme Court, which says it's about to get back into court in session 
in person uh, starting next month. It's been a year and a half, Nicole, since the high court has been hearing cases in person. The justices will be there, uh, but the public's not being allowed into chambers, at least uh, not yet. And here in New York City, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade uh, stepping off in a pretty big way this year and bringing some uh, old traditions back in uh, a pretty large way. You may recall last year, it wasn't much, confined to about a one-block parade around Macy's flagship store here in Manhattan. Well, this year, they're talking about bringing the full route back, or almost all of it, the big balloons, the big performers, and uh, the bands as well. The uh, only issue, the only requirement, if you will, Nicole, volunteers and participants need to be vaccinated, and they need to be wearing masks. All right, that's what I was going to ask you, and you answer the question for me. All right, Tom, thank you for that. All right, let's switch gears here. Union membership growing in the country. Today in Washington, President Biden meeting with workers as union dependent jobs like manufacturing are down and workers many places finding it more challenging to organize. News Nation White House correspondent Allison Harris live tonight. So Allison, put this into perspective for us. Well, Nicole, among the changes to the economy since the pandemic is the change in the number of union workers. They now make up nearly 11 percent of the American workforce, representing a larger percentage of American workers than at any time in the past five years. President Biden addressed those workers today from the East Room at the White House, calling them the heart and soul of the American economy. But work in this country is continuing to change. There are now more service industry jobs than manufacturing jobs. Labor unions are trying to respond to the rise of service industries, but they have been proven, they have proven difficult to unionize. Amazon workers at a plant in Alabama recently failed to unionize. The president attempting to reclaim the narrative about the recent poor jobs report says in this pandemic, workers are taking back the power as there is a scarcity of workers. New labor numbers show U.S. job openings rose to a record high in July of nearly 11 million. Small business owners across the country are struggling to find workers. President Biden suggesting that that is positive for workers. Everybody's mad at me because now, guess what? Employers are competing to attract workers. Worker power is essential to building our economy back better than before. We are inducting. The Labor Secretary also announced today that health care workers will now join the Labor Department's Hall of Honor, which has honored groups like the firefighters on 9-11. The president today pausing for a moment of silence for health care workers who have died while treating patients with COVID. Nicole? Yeah, so, so many. Uh, all right. Allison, thank you for that. Well, in less than a week, the verdict on California Governor Gavin Newsom will be delivered. Voters deciding should he stay or should he go? News Nation correspondent Nancy Liu is live for us tonight in Los Angeles. And Nancy, there are some heavy hitters weighing in on his potential recall. You're absolutely right, Nicole. The recall election really ramping up in California today with Vice President Kamala Harris here to campaign for Governor Gavin Newsom. With mail-in voting already underway, Republicans are hoping for a surge in yes votes leading into Tuesday. It's a Bay Area reunion that the vice president and California governor likely never envisioned. Kamala Harris and Gavin Newsom first worked together when she was a DA and he was San Francisco's mayor. Today they work together to fight off his recall. We want in our leaders someone like Gavin Newsom who always speaks the truth on behalf of all the people. In the next six days, we have to turn out the vote and vote no on this Republican recall. In this final stretch before September 14th, Governor Newsom has been campaigning all over California. Good morning, L.A. County. And in a state where registered Democrats outnumber Republicans by almost two to one, the Newsom camp has tapped other party heavyweights such as Elizabeth Warren. But the leading Republican candidate is unfazed. Conservative radio host Larry Elder is counting on the angry and dissatisfied. A third of all small businesses are now gone forever. And many of the businesses that are now open cannot find employees because we're paying employees not to work. 
In public comments, former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger said he was endorsing no one, but he described the atmosphere of anger over COVID and wildfires as similar to when he was swept into office in 2003. However, in a recent poll of likely voters by the Public Policy Institute of California, 58% said they would vote no on removing Newsom, with only 39% voting yes. And later this week, Bernie Sanders will be here in California to campaign for Governor Newsom. And then President Joe Biden will be here early next week. Also, new ads featuring Barack Obama are rolling out. Meantime, 46 recall challengers continue to attack Newsom on everything from his handling of COVID to crime, homelessness, and more. Nicole? 46 challengers, my goodness. All right, thank you, Nancy. One of the nation's largest Confederate monuments is no longer standing tonight. The Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond, Virginia is now in storage, removed today after more than 130 years. News Nation's Ben Dennis from our station WRIC has more on what the future now holds for that statue. Well, the 12-ton Confederate statue standing a tall six stories high is no longer a fixture over the former capital of the Confederacy here in Richmond. 130 years after celebration brought it up, a fist in the air to celebrate Robert E. Lee coming down. The statue left its pedestal over Richmond's famed Monument Avenue coming down after decades of debate, the latest racial reckoning, and a full year battled in the courts. Now, during excitement from supporters of the statue's removal, one person broke through security lines. The statue of the Confederate general was then cut into pieces. The bronze figure's torso was taken off of the horse and lowered to the ground. This was because of the sheer size, unable to fit itself on the flatbed of the truck to be hauled away. Now, here it's leaving Monument Avenue for one final time after all other Confederate statues that once lined the road for decades brought name to the street. Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, and more now are all gone. I'm just here to see that this treasonous, traitorous statue put where it belongs that's out of the public eye. And for all these people in Richmond that are still whining and crying about the statue brought, being brought down, I'm here to catch their tears. Now, I'm told the pieces of the Lee statue will be temporarily housed at a women's correctional center just west of Richmond. Now, some have long opposed removing these Confederate statues, but for those who have protested over the last year, Today was a moment of reckoning and one that a symbol of oppression is now gone. Back to you. All right, Ben, thank you. Well, today's removal of that statue, part of a nationwide push. Several military bases across the country are set to undergo name changes. And News Nation's Imani Payne from a Raleigh station, WNCN, has more on the effort to rename North Carolina's Fort Bragg. The base is one of several named after a Confederate leader, something Congress wants to do away with. So after more than 100 years, the name Fort Bragg will be changing. Now what it's changing to, though, remains unknown. Today, Garrison Commander Colonel Scott Pence is asking the public to play a main role in selecting the name, since it will be a major part of this community. The only solidified requirement so far is that the name be inspiring, have a connection to the area and to the base, and that it not be named after a Confederate leader. The name recommendation also does not have to be based on a person and can be something symbolic like honor or liberty. A panel of nine community leaders, including the Fayetteville mayor and Lumbee tribe chief, will help narrow down the names. Commander Pence says he expects there to be some back and forth as the list gets narrowed down, but that community input and acceptance is key. The name means something for all of us, so it's important that we're all involved in soliciting which names is going to be changed to and that everyone feels they have a role in the process. There will also be a Facebook Live town hall on the 14th for more community input. Pence also says he's an advocate of private businesses that have brag in their name to get reimbursement from the state or government to change their name if they so choose. Fort Bragg is one of 10 military installations across the country undergoing a name change. And the name changing process must be complete by January 2024. Reporting at Fort Bragg, Imani Payne, back to you. All right, Imani, thank you. One of the 13 U.S. service members killed in the Kabul airport attacks made his final homecoming. Thousands lined the streets in Cleveland to honor 22-year-old U.S. Navy hospital corpsman Maxton Soviak. He and the other killed service members were awarded Purple Hearts.
But a new letter written by Gold Star families is blasting how troops are treated, saying they're not protected nor supported. News Asian correspondent Joe Khalil joining us live tonight from Washington, D.C. So, Joe, what was said specifically in the letter? Well, Nicole, really, it was a, a call to action. Uh, more than 100 Gold Star family members signed on to it. We spoke to two of them today. Uh, they tell us, in part, it is a response to what happened in Afghanistan right now. One mother tells us it's hard to uh, see what's going on on the ground and not think that maybe her son's sacrifice, he lost his life there, is lost a little bit, given what's going on now. She said it's time for the country collectively to, you know, put our arms around these families. Another told me she's just sad seeing the country so divided right now at a time when she says we should be united at least around our service members. Uh, this letter does give some specifics. It asks the Department of Defense and the VA uh, just to be more emotionally supportive for these families. It asks for them to cut some of that red tape and all the paperwork they have to do just to get their benefits. Um, and it also is a unified call asking all politicians on the left and on the right to stop using Gold Star families as political pawns. Here's uh, Jenny Taylor, who lost her husband Brent in Afghanistan in 2018, putting it much more artfully than I ever could. I do think that it's not just Congress and the DOD that needs to listen. I think what we're asking is for American general to come together, stop pointing fingers, stop bickering, stop getting lost in bureaucracy and red tape, and look at not only how can we help our Gold Star families, how can we help our military, the survivors, the ones who came home, their families feel loved, feel supported. Now, that letter also calls on our leaders to lead. And that means explaining why America uh, has done what it's done, why it's made the decisions in foreign wars that it has made. Um, and it ends with the line, may we all be worthy and may we live as Americans worth dying for. I thought that was the most powerful point uh, of that whole letter. Nicole. Absolutely. Yeah, so important that those families have the support that they need. Joe, thank you. Well, more than 150 bullets fired into a North Carolina home. New surveillance video showing those shocking moments, which ended with a three-year-old boy dead. Tonight, police saying the suspects are high school students. And Elizabeth Holmes in court. Opening statements begin in the fraud trial against the Theranos founder. Protests planned at major U.S. airports. American Airlines pilots say they are overworked, they're fatigued, and they are fed up, ready to take their grievances to the picket line. News Nation correspondent Marky Martin joining us live tonight from Dallas. So, Marky, we've heard complaints for months about challenges for airports, for flight attendants, and now the people flying the planes. So, Nicole, we exactly. We're talking pilots here. And back in mid August, we knew that Southwest Airlines pilots had come forward saying that they plan to protest and picket what they claim to be unfair working conditions, saying that they would do so in the fourth quarter if things didn't change. And now the new piece of the puzzle as of this week is that American airline pilots now plan to do the very same. So the labor union representing American Airlines pilots came out this week, said that they would start what they're calling informational picketing within the next few weeks at the carrier's biggest hubs. And the two biggest hubs uh, that they named off in a release were Miami International and then Dallas. Fort Worth. And we know a lot of these pilots are coming forward uh, complaining about fatigue, well being, a, a lack of accommodations. So it really sounds like now both of these unions are going to join forces and make sure that their complaints are heard, their voices are heard. Although I will also add, it's unlikely that we see an actual pilot walkout uh, because that is prohibited by federal law. Nicole. All right, so, so Mark, you're trying to figure out what this is about. Is this, I'm assuming, pandemic related? Is this what brought it on? Absolutely. You know, the airline industry really struggled. They have yet to come back smoothly to business as normal. We're still not there yet. After 18 months of COVID-19, you had lost business, you had canceled routes, you had airplanes that went offline. And collectively in 2020, you know, the, the six biggest carriers lost $34 billion. And so now you have these pilots and all of these airline personnel coming forward and saying, yeah, we very much feel that loss and we're carrying 
bearing the brunt of it. In fact, Southwest and American have trimmed down their fall schedules just to try to alleviate some of these problems. And specifically, we're now hearing a lot of pilots come forward saying that they've worked this arduous stretch of being forced to work on their days off. They don't even have time to eat in between routes. And some of them showing up for these overnight stays on their trips, only to be turned away from hotels saying, hey, your, your airline company failed to provide solid proof of payment. So, um, yeah, tensions are high, and we could see these protests or, or, you know, picketing, I should say, happening within the next few weeks. Nicole. All right, yeah, tensions very high there. All right, Marky, thank you for that. But now we want to tell you about this tragic story out of North Carolina. More than 150 shots fired at a North Carolina house, killing a three-year-old little boy inside. And there's some shocking new video that shows the moments it happened. Neighborhood surveillance video showing multiple people opening fire bullets also struck that young boy's sister, but she is recovering tonight. News Nation's Morgan Francis with our Charlotte station, WJZY, is live for us tonight. So, Morgan, police are telling you that these suspects are high schoolers. Nicole, they are. Police say that there have been five shootings in the past few days, and there's all of them have a connection to Hopewell High School here in Charlotte and possibly two other local high schools. CMPD says what started out as teenage dispute games has turned into deadly games, taking two lives. A 16-year-old was also killed over the weekend. In new video from last night's shooting, it shows two cars coming up to a house on Richard Rizel Drive. And you can see two, a number of suspects get out of the cars, and you can hear them fire 150 rounds. Take a listen. One of those shots hit three-year-old Asaya Figaro in the head, killing him. His younger sister was grazed by a bullet and will physically be okay, but no doubt traumatizing. His great-grandmother says Asaya was a kind-hearted kid who just loved to play on his iPad. Police today are putting pressure on parents of those three high schools in the Charlotte area to question their kids, find out where they were last night, and help them figure out who's behind this senseless act. Nicole? Yeah, absolutely senseless. Our hearts go out to that family. Morgan, thank you. Well, tonight, more charges and the death of 25-year-old black man Amart Arbery, a former district attorney now being targeted for misconduct. How much time she could spend behind bars. And 14-time All-Star Derek Jeter headlining the Baseball Hall of Fame inductees today. And this year's ceremony happening with fans in attendance again. Welcome back to Rush Hour. Here's what's happening in your nation right now. For the second time in two weeks, a Florida judge has ruled against Governor Ron DeSantis' ban on mask mandates in schools. The judge sided with Florida parents who call the governor's order an overreach. The state is now challenging that ruling. One of the nation's largest Confederate monuments is now gone. Crews hauled away Richmond, Virginia's Robert E. Lee statue to storage. Contractors now searching for a time capsule buried underneath that monument. It will be replaced with new 2021 memorabilia. South Carolina's Supreme Court has indefinitely suspended the law license of attorney Alex Murdoch. It comes just two days after his law firm claimed he took money from the business and four days after he claimed someone shot him as he tried to change a tire on the side of the road. And all of this follows the murder of his wife and son, whom he found shot to death at home in early July. And so far, no one has been charged in those killings. Well, new details tonight in the case of murdered Georgia jogger Ahmad Arbery. Former Georgia District Attorney Jackie Johnson accused of trying to delay the arrest of the men charged with killing Arbery in February of 2020. News Nation's Janelle Fort live tonight from Atlanta. So, Janelle, what do we know so far about the accusations and, of course, about this arrest? 
Well, Nicole, we know that Jackie Johnson turned herself in this morning. She was booked fairly quickly and then released about 30 minutes later. She's being charged with misconduct, and state prosecutors allege that she used her position to delay the arrest of the white men who chased and killed Ahmaud Aubrey last year. Uh, last week, a grand jury indicted her on charges of violation of oath of a public officer, which is a felony, and obstruction of a police officer. The two charges come with a maximum sentence of six years in prison. County officials allege Johnson's office blocked them from arresting her former investigator Gregory McMichael and his son Travis before she recused herself from the case. McMichaels and their neighbor William Roddy Bryan are being charged with murder in Arbery's death. Now we spoke with Arbery's family attorney who says the latest charges are a good first step but they're hoping for even more charges to come down, this time against George Barnhill, the prosecutor Johnson initially handed the case to. We feel like he is also guilty of violation, violating the duty of his office because he explained to Wanda Cooper and to uh, his media, his official reports to the attorney general's office that a, a mob was engaged in some sort of burglary that the physical and video evidence shows never took place. And he began maligning the character of the victim and exonerating uh, the defendants from the very beginning. Uh, we believe that he is at least as equally culpable. And what we're seeing here is a continuing trend. Most recently, we saw it in the Elijah McLean case where a Colorado grand jury indicted three police officers and two paramedics involved in his death. And it's not just police officers facing consequences for these kinds of deaths anymore, Nicole. We're seeing paramedics and prosecutors are now also being charged. And it begs the question, who else could be held responsible? Yeah, things are certainly uh, changing a bit there. All right, Janelle, thank you. Well, today, the start of a long-awaited Theranos trial. All eyes on the founder and chief executive, Elizabeth Holmes. At one point, the college dropout was considered the youngest self-made female billionaire in history. She rubbed elbows with former and future presidents. News Nation's Felicia Bolton is here tonight. So, Felicia, though, behind the facade was a fake-it-till-you-make-it mentality that allegedly turned criminal. Yeah, at some point, you, you just got to stop faking it. The Fed say she's the scammer that shook down down Silicon Valley, promising game-changing technology that could test for hundreds of diseases with just a few drops of blood from a simple fingerprint. Now Elizabeth Holmes, whose wealth was once pegged at four and a half billion dollars, is facing a judge and a jury for a bloody promise she made in vain. No comment outside of the San Jose courtroom. Any comments, Elizabeth? Any comments, Elizabeth? As lines of people wait to catch a glimpse of Elizabeth Holmes. U.S. criminal investigators say the former tech genius is really a fraud through and through. From the way she spoke. It's our actions that will determine this new stereotype. To the claims of becoming the first female self-made billionaire. Her promises to revolutionize medicine with her startup, Theranos, ended with the scandalous collapse of a company once valued at $9 billion. But Holmes defense team says she did nothing wrong and the technology just failed, which isn't a crime. Holmes pleaded not guilty to 10 counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. According to recently unsealed court documents, the defense will likely include claims that Holmes was abused and controlled by her former boyfriend, Ramesh Sunny Balwani, who served as an executive at Theranos starting in 2009. He disputes the allegations. Federal prosecutors allege Holmes intended to mislead patients and investors about her startup's technology. She faces charges of defrauding them both. Today, the government is expected to introduce evidence of Holmes' lavish living, which included frequent stays at high-end hotels and trips on private jets. A stunning reversal from superstar to alleged super swindler. And if convicted, Holmes could face up to 20 years in prison if she is, in fact, convicted of all of these charges put together. The trial is expected to last up to three months. Nicole? Yeah, definitely keeping a close eye on this one. All right, Felicia, thank you. Well, baseball fans rejoicing the Hall of Fame is on this year. Iconic New York Yankees player Derek Jeter, one of four being inducted, and News Nation is live. And celebration tonight for the Free Britney movement. After more than 10 years, her father filing to end her conservatorship, her lawyer calling it a massive victory.
More activity brewing in the tropics tonight. Tropical storm Mindy has officially formed in the Gulf. So we're going to get right to Gerard Bailey in the weather center. So Gerard, Mindy could actually impact parts of Florida as soon as tonight. Yeah, good evening, Nicole. It's actually impacting them right now. The Sunshine State not quite living up to its name as Tropical Storm Mindy is already bringing some rainfall across there. Tropical storm warnings are in effect for some of these locations, especially uh, just to the south of Tallahassee. This is the official track that it's going to take from the National Hurricane Center. 45 mile per hour winds at this time, but as it moves on shore later tonight, dropping to 40 miles per hour. But it's not about the rain with this one. And regardless of Mindy's formation, they were going to see the chance for some flash flooding from the system. So we're already seeing flash flood warnings in for places like Panama City as this heavier rain moves in. In addition to the rain threat, the lower threats are also going to be maybe an isolated tornado as well as some of those winds gusting again 40, 50 miles per hour. And then Mindy will be moving out into the Atlantic, likely as a week state. Not the only place that we could see some flooding. Unrelated to Mindy, we're going to be seeing another system moving across parts of the Northeast. We have flash flood watches in place for parts of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Many of these areas that were hit, as you might recall, uh, about a week ago from that very terrifying flash flooding threat that they had, which killed so many people with the remnants of Ida. Not likely to see that same sort of thing tonight, but we will see that chance for a few thunderstorms to produce, again, some flash flooding later on tonight. All right, Gerard, thank you. We're going to keep talking about weather now and climate change. It's a critical issue debated across the globe. The threat so significant, the top three Christian leaders of the world releasing their first joint statement in history this week to encourage urgent action. And today, the Biden administration announcing a lofty goal, saying solar energy could produce nearly half of the country's electricity by the year 2035. So News Nation's Aaron Nolan is live for us tonight at a solar farm. This is in Washington County, Arkansas. So Aaron, you're going to unpack what this could look like for America's, for all of our future here. Yeah, Nicole, good evening to you. A very windy, a very sunny and bright Arkansas in front of this solar farm behind me. The sun's a good thing. The wind's kind of messing with my hair. But what we we're talking about is that energy report that came out today. And it talked about solar energy and the importance of that energy in order to change the footprint that we have right now. Let's go to what Gerard was just talking about, the remnants of Ida. Joe Biden, earlier today, the president toured New York and New Jersey. He emphasized how climate change is causing more extreme weather events. As a result, he is looking at ways to limit the impacts. Now, today's report focuses on solar energy as the cheapest, fastest growing source of clean energy. Let's break down those numbers for you. The Energy Department says that by 2035, solar energy has the potential to power 40% of the nation's electricity and employ 1.5 million people, this without raising the cost of your electric bills. Right now, solar energy accounts for just 3% of the country's power supply, but this study says the U.S. would need to quadruple its solar energy every year until 2035 to reach that goal. If that happens and the grid continues to quadruple its output each year, by 2050, Nicole, it would be able to provide more electricity than is currently used by all residential and commercial buildings in the United States. But outside of that green energy, it also comes down to green. We're talking about money. The thought process here is could Congress pass tax credits for businesses that transition over to more sustainable energy? Also mentioned in the port, it wasn't just this bright sun beaming down on us, Nicole. There was also hydroelectric and wind power mentioned as well. Back to you in studio. All right, Aaron, as you said, it all comes down to money. All right, thank you for that. Yeah. Well, the wait is over for baseball superstar Derek Jeter and three others finally inducted today into the Baseball Hall of Fame. That ceremony, of course, delayed by a year because of the pandemic. News Nation's Griffin Haas from our Albany station, WTEN, live for us tonight in Cooperstown. Griffin, tell us all about it. Hey, Nicole, yeah, four members of the Hall of Fame were officially inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame today. And uh, but I would say about 99% of the crowd here today, they were here to see number two, Derek Jeter, enter the hall. Now, Jeter was inducted alongside Colorado Rocky legend Larry Walker, Cardinal great Ted Simmons, and 
former executive of, executive of the Players Union, Marvin Miller. But this day was headlined by the man appropriately nicknamed Mr. November. Jeter, the man who led the Yankees to five championships, tallying over 3,000 hits along the way, says it all began with his first role model, his dad. I was first introduced to competition in the game of baseball by my dad. You know, I, I vividly remember going to watch him play shortstop for his corporate softball team. And uh, you know, I don't think I ever told him this, but I, I was amazed at how good he was and how he stood out in front of, every, stood out in front of everyone else, above everyone else. He was my first idol. Now the other headliner, Larry Walker, who made it into the hall on his last trip on the ballot. You could tell Walker really wanted to soak in this moment. He took the time to film the crowd on his cell phone before starting his speech. The three-time batting chap said today he never felt like a Hall of Famer. Well, there's no fighting that feeling now. Now, this was actually the 2020 class going in today. The ceremony last year postponed during the pandemic. The 2020 class finally getting their moment today. All right, so Griffin, I know we're on a little bit of a delay. And of course, you know, the ceremony delayed a year. So you just got to tell us what was this like for the fans who had waited an extra year for this? Man, the fans were wild today, especially the Yankee fans. Again, about 99% Yankee fans here. There were chants of Jeter, Jeter throughout, even when he wasn't talking. It was a very, very lively crowd. Again, mainly here to see number two, but Larry Walker got a great round of applause as well. Uh, but a very lively crowd, a very lively Yankee for crowd here today. Congrats to all of those inductees. Griffin, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Well, is Britney finally free? Britney Spears' father formally filing to enter conservatorship after 13 years, saying he wants what's best for his daughter. Britney Spears' father may be willing to step down from her from her conservatorship, but that doesn't mean he won't be investigated for his treatment of his daughter. Let's bring in entertainment correspondent Sam Rubin from our Los Angeles station KTLA. He has all the Hollywood headlines. So, Sam, could this spell some legal trouble for Britney's dad? I tell you what, Nicole, there's two stories going on here. Number one, Britney's dad making the headline by announcing he would like to withdraw from the conservatorship and the conservatorship should end. Is he doing that because A, he feels extraordinary pressure and a possible investigation from Britney's own attorney that maybe he, Jamie Spears, the father, has misused some funds, or B, because he knows Britney isn't well and he feels the judge knows it too and won't allow the conservatorship to be dissolved. So this could be a strategic move or a move to uh, avoid any investigation from Britney's attorney. Still mystery, whole thing goes before a judge at the end of the month and then we'll see what happens. But this free Britney movement may not find total freedom for Britney by the end of the month. I think the dad knows what many are concerned about that Britney still is not well. Yeah, so many twists and turns to that one. All right, Sam, let's uh, head across the pond now where they're calling Prince Andrew the runaway prince, saying he's hiding at the Queen's Castle trying to escape being served papers for sex assault. Uh, yes, uh, somebody involved with Jeffrey Epstein, a photo taken with this woman and Prince Andrew when she was underage. Virginia Guffrey has never let this go. She is suing uh, the prince, saying that she was the victim of abuse by his hand. He has ducked serving of his papers, is staying at a royal uh, residence uh, with the queen, or at least owned and operated by the queen, and some say he is there strictly to avoid service. This has been something that has hung around his neck for years. And Virginia, the woman in question who's participated in several documentaries, says she will not let this go until she hears from the prince directly, ideally in a court of law. All right, let's talk some positive news now. Better call Saul fans rejoicing because Bob Odenkirk is back on set after his health scare. Rejoicing is the right word, Nicole, exactly right. Six weeks after the health scare, Bob Odenkirk posting a photo from the makeup chair at Better Call Saul saying that he is back, that he appreciates everybody's good wishes, that he loves the crew and living in Albuquerque. Breaking Bad people did the same thing too. They decamped to Albuquerque. They're there basically 24 seven as they put one of the best TV shows in the world together. New episodes of Better Call Saul certainly have been delayed, but Bob is feeling much better in front of the cameras today. 
I think we can look forward to those new episodes in 2022. You bet. My floor director, Brandon, is nodding his head yes. He's happy he is back. All right, Sam, thank you for that. Live from our News Nation headquarters in Chicago, here's a look at what's happening in your nation right now. The FBI releasing new video of the person suspected of planting pipe bombs outside DNC and RNC headquarters in Washington, D.C., ahead of the Capitol riot. Footage showing that suspect pacing back and forth in front of a row of houses, carrying a backpack, and sitting down on a bench. More than eight months after the pipe bombs were reported, the suspect still has not been arrested. The trial began today for 20 men accused in the 2015 terror attacks in Paris. Nine of the 10 attackers died by suicide bomb or were killed by police. Facing a judge today, the sole surviving attacker and the other men accused of planning that attack. Prosecutors say three people have been arrested for stealing the identities of seven victims of the Surfside, Florida condo collapse. The state's attorney says they posed as those victims and ordered replacement credit cards that were mailed to alternate addresses. They are facing multiple charges. Well, as always, we do like to leave you with a smile when we can, but tonight we may actually leave you scratching your head. And this is why. You're probably familiar with McDonald's large purple blob character named Grimace, right? We all know who he is. According to one store manager, Grimace is supposed to be a giant taste bud. Now, this is not some random manager's claim either. This guy was awarded Outstanding Manager of the Year, so we assume he knows what he's talking about. Obviously, the internet freaking out about this right now. Grimace, actually not a cute plump blob after all, but a human taste bud. There you go, chew on that. And that is all for Rush Hour tonight. A reminder, you can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next up, The Dolan Report. Then later tonight on Balance with Leland Bittert, then News Nation Prime and Banfield. And do not forget, you can check headlines anytime at newsnationnow.com. And you can download our free News Nation Now app. Have a great night.